Chairman of Public Law, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Jack Ford as our uh, guest today. You all know Mr. Ford as, as the senior anchor on uh, Court TV. Uh, he's held a number of positions in uh, television media, including times at NBC, um, CBS affiliate in New York, and ABC, as well as some time on ESPN. Uh, he now co-anchors uh, Banfield and Ford uh, from 1 to 3 in the afternoon uh, on Court TV. And he has um, a distinguished uh, academic record from Yale University, where he was both a uh, student and a uh, student athlete on the varsity football team for three years, then a degree from Fordham Law School, and then, as I say, has spent a number of years covering law and trials and legal institutions in various capacities. His work in that regard has earned a number of awards, including several Emmys and a Peabody, as well as a number of others. And he's here today to talk uh, somewhat generally about uh, high visibility trials, great trials, and, and the interaction between uh, the media and the justice system, and also, of course, some particular references to our local uh, large trial that's going on right now uh, with respect to the Duke Lacrosse uh, team members. So with that introduction, let me have you help uh, me welcome Jack Ford to the podium. Professor, thank you. Um, I'm delighted to come down and spend some time with you folks. Uh, serendipitously, I was able to coordinate this with Professor Schrader and also with a basketball game tonight. So <laughs> it is indeed a pleasure for me to be down here. Um, what we want to do. I think you're playing Yale. I'm not sure, but that's what happened. Uh, when I had spoken to Professor Schrader about stopping in and, and visiting, um, I said to him what I wanted to, to talk, and, and hopefully this will become a dialogue very shortly. My idea is to, to chat and give you some thoughts and observations for about half the time here, and then hopefully open it up to some of your questions and observations. But, I said to him, what I, what I find that um, law students seem to be interested in and what I enjoy talking to law students about are, are the notion of high profile trials and cases and what they say about what will soon be your profession, what was my profession. I, I still uh, think of myself um, as a lawyer. I spent about 18 years trying cases as both a prosecutor and defense attorney. Um, tried almost 200 cases, everything from uh, defended half a dozen death penalty cases to antitrust cases. So I still think of myself as a lawyer, even though I've been in the journalism business for almost 20 years. Indeed, I was inter introduced once recently as a recovering lawyer, which I thought was a sort of curious appellation. But I've always found that it's interesting for to, me to talk about it, and especially to talk to people um, such as yourselves who are soon going to be in that profession. You know, there's always been a fascination on our part with high profile trials and cases. Um, when you think about it, um, it, courthouses were always constructed in the centers of, of small towns and county seats. Um, indeed, we still, when we build new courthouses, we don't build them out on the margins where we put airports, we put them in the center of cities and towns. And the reason is that historically, what happened in those courthouses really was integral to the community. It was in many ways the center of the community. And if you think about the attraction, it, it's, it's a fairly simple formula. It's because what happens in those courthouses, in those courtrooms, is the, the real drama. And I, I tell people that uh, on court TV that we are, in fact, probably the only genuine reality show on television. Because all the others that build themselves as reality shows, shows are, are scripted to some extent, heavily edited. But what we do on Court TV is we show a trial from start to finish. We don't know what the result is going to be. It is real drama in real courtrooms. And I think that's the compelling part about what happens in courtrooms. It, it has all the elements of real drama. You start off with conflict, because if there's not a conflict, you don't end up in a courtroom in the first place. Uh, you have uncertainty throughout the course of that trial. And then ultimately, you have some resolution. But what's interesting about trials is even with resolution, sometimes the resolution itself generates additional conflict. So you can see why there has always been that fascination and that attraction to what goes on inside of courtrooms. And in addition to that, in addition to the notion of, of the real drama and the fascination with courtrooms, what I often talk to groups such as yourselves about is the fact that those trials and cases can provide defining moments for professions. And just as with individuals, 
Um, it, we, it, professions have defining moments. And as with individuals, what's interesting is a moment doesn't necessarily have to be accurate to nevertheless be a defining moment. And we've seen that throughout the course of time, various trials as they apply to various professions. A couple of illustrations for you. Uh, the Lindbergh kidnapping trial. Um, I don't know how familiar some of you may be with that, but I've always been of the opinion, and, and I actually, during the course of the first O.J. Simpson trial, and I covered both of those trials, but during the first one, people were describing the Simpson trial as the trial of the century, and I did a piece on NBC News comparing the Lindbergh trial to the O.J. Simpson trial, and came away from it absolutely convinced that the Lindbergh trial not only is a trial of the century, but probably was awfully close to the trial of the century. You know, it, it, it dealt with a, a hero of enormous proportion. We nowadays can't begin to imagine how big a hero Charles Lindbergh was back in the late 20s. You think, okay, you know, he flew a plane across the Atlantic. Um, for us, that that's doesn't seem to be a huge achievement. Then it was an enormous achievement at a time when the world was looking for a hero. And this sort of tall, this, this lanky, good-looking, very shy young man uh, flies a plane across the Atlantic, and he becomes that hero. And the level of adulation, if you look back on it and talk with historians about this, are, is, was staggering. So that when that child was kidnapped, not just this country, but the world felt that they had been violated, that their child had been kidnapped. And when the body was found literally uh, three miles from the home, and, and if you know the story, apparently the theory is during the kidnapping, the kidnapper fell from a ladder and the child was killed, probably right then and there, was buried some three miles from the house, and then the search went on for months for this child. But when the trial finally began, it became a defining moment for the media, but in a very destructive way. Now again, defining moments don't need to be positive. And people looked at the, the, the Lindbergh trial, when you look back at it now, and you're absolutely staggered by some of the things that were going on with regard to the media and the coverage. I'll give you some illustrations, and, and, and you folks, I'm sure if you haven't studied this, may be surprised at some of this. The attorney for Bruno Hauptmann, who was the man who was convicted of the kidnapping, the attorney for Bruno Hauptmann was retained and paid for by one of the tabloid newspapers of the time. And the arrangement was that gave them access. Defendant. So they're paying his bills. He was apparently alcoholic. He died shortly after the trial. And people, historians now look back on it and say, how could they have ever let the man in the courtroom? So his bills are being paid by a newspaper. The, the case was tried in a, a very tiny farming town courthouse in Flemington, New Jersey. It has been preserved since. It became the identity of the town. I actually, when I was a young lawyer, tried a case inside of this courtroom. And the, the jurors' seats are roped off in velvet on the side. And it, 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 it sort of is a fascinating journey into history. But it, it, the entire world descended upon this small town. And the jurors were put up in a hotel across the street from the courthouse. And at the end of the day, they literally walked through a gauntlet. And if you see some photographs of this, it's astonishing. Well, a gauntlet of public that was out there. And they would stay in the second floor of the hotel. Well, the reporters stayed in the third floor of the hotel. And every night, after dinner, the reporters would come downstairs and knock on the door of the jurors, and they'd chat about what was going on inside the courtroom. <laughs> and you hear these stories now. And I was, I, I, when I was doing research for this piece, I, I kept saying to myself, that can't be true. And I actually got a chance to interview one of the last surviving jurors, and then somebody else who had sat through the trial, and they told me it was absolutely true. No, nobody thought that there was anything wrong with that at the time. And as a consequence of, of, of the way the media covered this trial, they actually had pirated in one of those old, you know, the old movie tone cameras that you see, and, and there would be video that's shown in the movie theaters. Well, the, the trial judge professed not to have known that they brought it in. But it was literally in the courthouse, it has a back balcony, the way that some of those old courthouses were constructed. They would have people hanging from the balconies because everybody wanted to get in to see this. And they had this, this movie tone camera up there cranking out film for, for a good portion of the trial before, for whatever reason, the judge finally banned it. And, and it captured some wonderful moments. There is film of Charles Lindbergh sitting in the courtroom uh, testifying. And it was a fairly barren courtroom, just a chair, not a witness box, just a chair. And he's sitting there testifying. Also some film of Bruno Hauptmann, who took the stand to defend himself, being berated by the prosecutor and shouting back at him not to yell at me in this very broken German accent. 
But the consequence of all of this, when I talk about defining moments, is that there was a backlash against the media. And you folks might not realize this. Some of you are, are old enough my age that you will remember this. For decades, you could not get a camera inside a courtroom in this country. I'm not talking about television cameras. I'm talking about even a still camera. There was an entire profession that was born of the Lindbergh trial, and they were courtroom sketch artists. So the best you could get for the great trials of, of the decades would be a, an artist sitting in the front row with a, an easel and, and either pencils or colored chalks sketching out a person who was on the witness stand. And that was the extent of, of visual media coverage for trials for decades. All of this as a consequence of the Lindbergh trial. Some of these cases will be defining moments for professions, specifically the legal profession. Now, I, I as I said to you, I covered the OJ trial, uh, both the OJ trials. And what I say about the first one has nothing to do with the verdict. I'm not talking about, I, I still to this day have not given my opinion on the OJ trial verdict. Um, I, I'm sort of the older school journalist. I, I think that my job is essentially to distill information, to become a conduit of that information for the consumers out there, pass it on to them, absent my opinions, and let them assess it. So I, I, even when I was covering the case, and, and I would re repeatedly have people when I was doing an interview say, well, well what do you think? You know, who won today? Who's winning today? Who's ahead? What's the verdict going to be when the jury was deliberating? And I had always refused to answer it and still have. So my comments don't have anything to do with the verdict, because that's a verdict that people will always argue about. But my comments do have a lot to do with the image of the legal profession as a consequence of this, as a defining moment. Again, this comes back to what I said to you earlier, that it doesn't have to be an accurate moment to become a defining moment. Here's what I said about the O.J. Simpson trial before it began. I had seen Judge Ito. Um, we had covered a case when I was with Court TV originally when it started in 1991 that Judge Ito had presided over. He had done a magnificent job with it. It was, a, it was one of the few state prosecutions for the savings and loan frauds that took place back in the late 80s, early 90s. He did a wonderful job as a trial judge. Johnny Cochran and I had been friends for years. We had handled cases together back when I was trying cases. Um, a, a very good friend of mine. Barry Sheck was a friend. We had covered a case at Court TV that Marsha Clark had prosecuted. I thought she was a marvelous prosecutor. I actually said on the air before this trial was started that I thought that this case, regardless of what the verdict was going to be, would be a high watermark for the legal profession, to give you some sense of how wrong I absolutely was. And, and I, I, I should have noticed that we're taping this, because journalists don't often like to admit when we're that <laughs> dramatically wrong. But I was. But I, I just thought, with all of these good players in place, that at the end of the trial, again, regardless of what happened, people could walk away, and, and there, that was the value, I thought, of having cameras in the courtroom. People would walk away saying, you know what? I like the way our process works. And I was basing it upon the fact that, if you remember, let me ask you a question, because I, I know you folks, a lot of you are younger. How many of you followed the O.J. Simpson trial, the first one, to, to any significant extent on, when it was taking place? Okay, good. Um, it, it always scares me sometimes when I come into groups and if I start talking, not being sure of what their age is, as I was speaking at a college recently, and I used a line from the movie The Graduate, okay? The graduate is my sort of college and lifetime, and I got a, a just a wall of blank faces. And I'm saying, Dustin Hoffman, anything? Anything. Bueller? Bueller. It, 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 in any event, um, what happened, if you remember, is they started to present this to a grand jury. And there was a problem. They had to blow up the grand jury. And they did it by virtue of a probable cause here in front of a judge. It was televised for a week. It was one of the great civics lessons of all time. And I was amazed at how many people would come up, and we had covered it, at how many people, I was with NBC at the time, how many people would come up afterwards and said, I never knew that's the way the system worked. I never knew that it wasn't just a police officer saying, I'm charging with you, and now you have to go to trial. That there was some buffer in between. And, it, and I was thinking, what a great teaching tool this has been. So I went into the OJ trial thinking this thing this was, was going to be great. Plus, if you think about it, it, it to me, it had a number, when we talk about drama, it had a number of those components, issues that needed to be talked about, uh, violence, spousal abuse, race, the wages and, and payments of celebrity. So I thought this was going to be important. And there was just an extraordinary amount of attention on this. Anywhere, any airport I was ever in, people would come running up. I tell, true story, 
Uh, it was about two months into the trial. And again, illustrating the fascination with this. Two months into the trial, and I was going back and forth between Los Angeles and New York because I was hosting the Weekend Today show at the time. So I'd spend a couple of days in the courthouse, come back. When I was back in New York, NBC was getting a live feed from the trial, and we'd do a, a sort of two-minute um, hit at the top of each hour, just sort of doing a, a news update that I would anchor. So just about every morning, I'd be on the Today Show first to talk about what was going on in the trial and then do this. So I'd been up since about 3.30 in the morning, had done a, the Today Show piece, had a few hours left, and went across the street and from Rockefeller Center to a hotel to just basically take a nap for a couple hours. So I check in the hotel, and it's a place that we, we all stay at regularly. And as I'm checking in, the fellow behind the desk is very nice and says, Mr. Ford, nice to see you again. You know what, we've upgraded you from your room on the 10th floor. You're up in the suites on the 47th floor. And you know, this, that becomes significant in a moment. So I said, all right, fine, thank you, I appreciate that. So I get up there. Um, jump into bed, I'm sound asleep, and at about 11 o'clock, I hear alarms going off. And I jump out of bed, and, and, and I pick up the phone. The phone is dead, no power in the room. I look out the window, and I look down, there's 47 floors, and I see the hotel is surrounded by fire trucks and EMS vehicles. Go to the door, open the door, there's smoke in the hallway. So now at this point, that keenly trained analytical legal mind says, I think I should probably get out of here. It's not the place to be. <laughs> Grab my stuff. And I was in the corner uh, right by the stairwell. But now, here's where now being on the 47th floor instead of the 10th floor becomes significant. So I start walking down these floors. I get to about the 34th floor, and I come across two older foreign women who don't speak any English at all. They're standing in the stairwell, and they don't know what to do. So I finally convince them to come with me. We'll go down. What I can't convince them to do is to leave their luggage. I'm now carrying <laughs> their luggage, 34 floors down. So we wind our way down. We get to the bottom, myself, the two ladies. They're very heavy baggage. And I actually so it sounds fairly melodramatic, but it's true. There, there were some doors that opened into a courtyard in, the, in the, um, the hotel. So I sort of kick the doors open, and they swing open, and some smoke comes billowing out. And here we come, the two ladies, me, carrying the bags. An EMS guy comes running up to me, all right? Now, you would think that the first question he would have would be, are you OK? Are the ladies OK? Anybody else in there? He runs up and he says to me, Mr. Ford, what do you think? Is OJ guilty? <laughs> and I remember thinking, how can it be that it's that important that at that moment in my life, you need to ask me whether OJ is, is guilty or not? But as I said, it, it's, it's fairly indicative of the, the level of the interest on that case. So as that case is being tried now, what I see is a constant state of deterioration in the courtroom. And I was sitting there that we had, we had assigned seats. It's funny because people often talk about this as being a media circus. And I say, you know what? If you were there, you would never describe it as a media circus. It was the most highly controlled media environment, one of the most, that I've ever been involved in. And you know what? I've covered inaugurations, presidential debates, uh, Olympics, um, all of these things. We were so controlled inside of that courtroom. If you look down to surreptitiously read a newspaper in the midst of some of the crushingly boring testimony, you'd be thrown out of the courtroom. F colleagues of mine got thrown out of the courtroom for having a tic-tac in their mouth in the middle of testimony. It was very strictly regulated. Outside of the courthouse was different. Outside of the courthouse was very reminiscent of the film you see of outside of the Lindbergh courthouse where there were literally booths set up and people, barkers set up. Anybody who had an issue seemed that this was the, the place to be. It was, it was ground zero for all of the issues in the world right there. And people hawking t-shirts and buttons. So we'd be sitting in the courtroom and, and we had, as I said, assigned seats. And I sat between uh, Dominic Dunn, who's a, a well-known writer, some of you might know, um, and a celebrity writer. Uh, but uh, you're know, a good friend, very smart man, and Jeffrey Tubin, and Jeff works for CNN, had been a federal prosecutor. You know, I had been a prosecutor trial lawyer for years, so so we kind of knew what was going on in this courtroom and what should be going on. And throughout the trial, Dominic would continually lean over and he'd say to us, "What what are they doing?" And Jeff and I would kind of look at each other and say, "I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know what they're doing here." And it, it just got completely out of control. And I've said this to all the players, because I've interviewed them all. And as I said to you, some of them are, are, are I consider good friends of mine. It became, and, and I blame the lawyers. A lot of people blame Judge Ito. I, I don't, at least not as much. 
because he started off saying what I said before the trial. And he said, so you might remember this, he said to all the lawyers, my fervent hope is at the end of this trial, regardless of how it comes out, we will all be able to go out for dinner together and talk about our professional experiences. Well, the reality is we had betting pools going on as to who was going to throw the first punch, truly, because that's how it had deteriorated inside of, of that courtroom. I, I called it a, a kind of a form of legal bungee jumping by the lawyers, that basically what they were doing, both sides, they were sort of jumping off, and the plan was to go as far as we could go until something pulls us back. And what was happening, at least in the beginning of the trial, is nothing was pulling them back. So you had speeches constantly. They would start the day, and as I said, I've tried a couple hundred trials in my life, and, and I was fascinated by this. They would start their day at the podium like this, jurors waiting in the room, and each side would take turns complaining about the other side, about what they said on Larry King the night before, about all sorts of things. And, and I just thought to myself, why are we doing this now when you have a jury in the room and you have witnesses waiting, and this trial took nine months to try when it should have taken, at, at most, the three that the civil case took to try. Why are we doing this? And it, it just, I, my sense was those who were within the midst of it, the lawyers and the judge, lost sight of it. You know, it's, it's one of those you can't see the forest for the trees scenarios. And it just continued to get worse, even when Judge Ito tried to, to rein them all back in, because you might remember he, he did attempt to do that for the last third of it, got the trial moving more quickly. But as a consequence of this, my feeling has always been this. Most people never set foot in a courtroom in their lives. And if they do, it might be their local municipal court for a parking ticket. So the majority of people have no experience within our court system. It is the most mysterious of the three branches. Everybody knows what the executive branch does. We see them all the time. Nowadays, we see everything that the legislative branch does. But with, with the limited access of cameras in the courtroom, a lot of people don't know what goes on inside those courtrooms. So the sad thing is, your image of the justice system is based upon Judge Judy, where somebody comes in and they yell at each other for a little while and there's a commercial. <laughs> or, even more sadly in many ways, the O.J. Simpson trial. And I, ha I would have people come up to me saying, man, how do you make your living in that business? Or how did you make your living in that business? Uh, and this comes back to, again, what I said before. It was an inaccurate moment, but a defining moment nonetheless. And most people had no confidence in our justice system. What I've always said in the past, and I'm sure you've studied this, any type of trial, you're going to have disagreement at the end. Because if it wasn't disagreement to start with, you wouldn't have needed a trial. What we need to have is people at least confident, at the very least comfortable with the process. And if you're confident and comfortable with the process, then you can handle verdicts that you disagree with. We just finished covering a case on, on Court TV that ended up getting a lot of publicity. A, a, a wife, mother, married to a Marine on a base in San Diego. And she was um, indicted, charged with his murder for having poisoned him. He died, looked like suddenly, 23 years old. After months, they discover heavy metal, um, high levels of heavy, heavy metals in some of his organs. Goes to trial. It, just about every analyst we had on Court TV and everybody I talked to who was watching it thought she was going to be found not guilty. The, 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 just universally, people were saying, there's just not enough evidence here. They haven't answered any questions. There's no motive answer. None of these things. Jury came back and found her guilty, to the surprise of, of just about everybody. But I didn't get the complaints I heard from the OJ trial, because the people who watched it knew it was a fair trial, with good prosecutors, good defense lawyers, very good judge. So they, they, were, they were able to disagree with the result, but still be comfortable with the process. And that's the most you can ask for in a justice system. With, with OJ, that's not what we got. And, and I have said for, for years, what we need is another great defining moment, another big trial that the media could cover in the same fashion so that people can say, oh, I, I see. Now I understand how this system works and how the OJ trial was an aberration here. I covered the Oklahoma City bombing trial. And, and I said frequently, I wish there was a camera in this courtroom. It was a federal court, so there are no cameras. That might change, I don't know. But it, it just was a magnificent illustration of justice. Again, whether you agree with the verdict or not, although there weren't that many people that disagreed with the verdict against Timothy McVeigh. But again, the trial itself gave you a sense of majesty of the justice system that would prevail even in the face of disagreement over verdict. 
but we haven't found another one of those yet. But as you can see, we're talking about then those, those illustrations of situations and cases which can become defining moments. Legal profession, you're about to enter. Media profession, which is my business now. And that gets me then to some thoughts and observations about what's going on with the Duke case. And I'm, I'm focusing here more on media than I am um, the legal process at this point. One of the difficulties nowadays, compared to when I started in this business, I got started, I literally stumbled into the, the journalism business. Um, I had defended the first death penalty case in the Northeast back in 1983. A number of groups had come to me and said, you know, it's the first one, um, will you do this for us? So I, I agreed to do it. Because it was the first of the death penalty cases, we had a lot of media attention, cameras in our courtroom. Um, I did a series of interviews afterwards. One of them was with the um, CBS affiliate in New York, in New York City. And when we finished it, the, the, um, the news director came up to me and he said, you, you seem sort of comfortable. Have you done TV before? And I said, you know what? I have, my football coach at Yale had a little weekly show in New England. This was back in the late 60s and early 70s when Ivy League football was a little bit better than it is, than it is now. Uh, and I had, been on, I had been on Jeopardy three times when I was in law school and won a bunch of money to, to pay for law school. So I said, well, you know, I said, that's my television experience, th three days on Jeopardy and, you know, a couple of, of uh, college football shows. So they, they said, would, would you like to do this, be our, our legal analyst and come on once a week? So I, I got started in this business on a different path. As I said, I'd spent a lot of years as a trial lawyer first and then sort of jumped into this. So I didn't travel the same journey that a lot of journalists do. And, and in many ways, I think that's been helpful because I look at it a little bit differently. The, the media business has changed dramatically in the 22 years or so that I've been involved in it. If you think about it, when I first started in 1984, there were three broadcast networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, and one fledgling cable network, CNN, that had just gotten started. That was it. That's, if you're watching television, that's what you're watching. And then your local affiliates here. In the interim, what has happened, my, my friend Tom Brokaw, I think, has a very apt description for it. Tom described it as the Big Bang Theory for media, you know, reminiscent of the Big Bang Theory, the creation of the universe, and uh, these heavenly obstacles floating around out there. Well, now you have literally hundreds of cable channels, and you have any number of 24-hour news networks. I was involved in the, the startup of actually two of them. I was on the air the first day for Court TV in 1991 and on the air the first day for MSNBC. I was working at NBC at the time, and basically the NBC folks, anchors and correspondents, would go and, and work on MSNBC. So I've seen the creation of two of them here. But I've also seen some of the problems that have come with the birth of, of these networks and the explosion of this universe. What you see is, is this. In the old days, the networks had very little time to fill. Indeed, the veterans always complained about how little opportunity they had for newscasts. You know, they all had morning shows, although it, for, for a long period of time, ABC's morning show, Good Morning America, which I worked on for a while, was in their entertainment division. It wasn't a news show. The others had their news shows. Everybody had their nightly news, only a half hour. And then there were some a smattering of news magazines. That's all they had. Now, with the creation of the news networks, the cable networks, you have to feed an enormous and ravenous beast, 24 hours. There needs to be something coming out in their air every minute for 24 hours. And as a consequence of that, what has evolved is the, the, the business of what I often refer to as opinion in the guise of news. And it, it's a criticism that I have, and I know I'm in the midst of it myself um, in terms of a, of, of a profession. Personally, I, it's, it's not something that I've engaged in, but I'm in the middle of it and I recognize it. So what you have now and is this. Over the years, the programmers have discovered something. It's kind of unfortunate, I think, but I can understand it. They've discovered that what brings in viewers, in many instances, is opinion delivered loudly, frequently, and not often based upon fact. But it gets viewers. And the sad thing in, in my business now is, I was speaking with Professor Schrader beforehand, I used to do, in, in the early 90s, moderate these series of panels that we would air on PBS, on public television. And they were these roundtable seminars run by a fellow named Fred Friendly in the Columbia School of Journalism. Fred was always described as the conscience of journalism for years. And we would get these, these wonderful people, we'd be funded by all sorts of organizations, and just you would get a great in-depth look at serious issues. Well, we can't get them on the air anymore because the, the, the people who pay the money for them will say, well, I, you can't get ratings with that because nobody's throwing anything at somebody else. 
There's no yelling going on. There's not that kind of, there was intellectual confrontation, or I should say intellectual adversaries, but not the confrontation. You know, I, I taught in law school for years. I taught trial advocacy, and I used to say to my law students, you know what, Some, the problem is we oftentimes confuse the notion of an adversarial system with a confrontational system. You don't always need to be confrontational to be effectively adversarial. But what we're seeing develop in the media now is oftentimes what sells is opinion. Now, don't misunderstand me. I think there is absolutely a place in the, in the media universe for opinion-driven programming. My problem with it is when it's, as I said before, under the guise of news. When there's not a clear delineation that this is news, this is journalism where we're providing information for you. In, in, in hopes that we can get enough facts to lead you to a place, as opposed to this is now opinion program. This is editorial, and that's fine, because a, opinion and editorializing can drive a debate and sometimes can drive it very, very effectively. But here's the problem. Thomas Jefferson once said that opinion is power, and it's true. But what can be very difficult about that equation is that misinformed opinion or ill-informed opinion can also be very powerful, especially in my business. I've seen what, when people see things and hear things on television, it, it's uh, intriguing to me that they, in many instances, just say, well, it's gotta be true, I heard it on television. And this now gets me to my thoughts on the coverage of the Duke case. Again, understanding, I'm, I'm not saying there's no role. There is a very important role for that notion of opinion. But it, it should be characterized the way you see the good newspapers, where you have your front page, which is the reporting of the facts. You have your back page, which is the editorial page, where people give opinions. You might have an analysis section there. But it, it's characterized as analysis, which means not quite editorial, but not quite just hard fact reporting. There's more going on here. And the difficulty is that people watching the news channels now oftentimes don't either have the ability or the inclination or are not given the opportunity to delineate between what should be reporting of facts and what is opinion. Now here's one of the first things that I learned uh, trying cases, and that is that, that you don't know what the answer is to a case until the very end of it, until a jury knocks and tells you what it is. And, and I have, have, have always been the first one when people ask me these questions, you know, what, what's gonna happen? Are they gonna be convicted? Will they be indicted? You know, and I am always very quick to say, look, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know the facts. But let me tell you what both sides could be about this. And what has, has perplexed me and disturbed me about a good portion of the coverage of the Duke case is the certainty with which so many people have talked about it. And then the equally perplexing aspect of it is how that certainty has changed. You know, there's a, 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 one of the great theologians said one time that, that too great a certainty in terms of justice can often result in injustice. And it's sort of an interesting thought. Because, again, justice is a process. It's not instant. So what has fascinated me then is, is this. I am the first to say, and, and I've said it repeatedly on all sorts of air, I don't know what happened in that house. Only a few people do. And I don't pretend to know what happened inside of that house. I have questions as both a journalist and a former prosecutor and a former defense lawyer that I would ask of both sides in terms of this case. But I don't, don't have anything close to the certainty of facts that would allow me to stake out opinions here. And what we saw with the media coverage is this instantaneous judgment making. In the very beginning, first thing that you saw was, was the, the entire, not just the Duke lacrosse team, but the entire lacrosse culture was indicted and convicted. And again, I'm prefacing all this by saying, I don't know if anybody is guilty of anything in this case. Hopefully we'll learn that story. But I looked at that, I remember going on, at, at, I had done an ESPN show once for a year called The Sports Reporters, which was based upon issues. And so, so regularly, um, you know, I'll go on ESPN radio and talk about legal cases or sporting news radio. And I remember one of the, the, the anchors asked me this question. I said, all right, first off the bat, I said, full disclosure, I have a son who's a lacrosse, college lacrosse player. My son is a sophomore at Yale uh, on the varsity lacrosse team. He also knows, played with and against some of the members of the Duke lacrosse team. And 
and my first comment was, I don't see how, again, without knowing what happened there, the notion of an indicting an entire culture was troubling to me. And I said, you know, generalities are always difficult to make, and they're usually wrong. I said, I can tell you, you know, I played college football with number one NFL draft choices and Rhodes Scholars. And I had a, a, a nice collection of people that I played with. Um, I look at my son and his teammates, and I say, you know, th how could you indict these, these guys as part of an overarching indictment? They're great kids. They all graduate. They get good jobs. The NCAA graduation rates for lacrosse is one of the highest of all. So again, it has nothing to do with what happened in that house, although there are observations, I think, that were, were genuine and that needed to be dealt with. But that set the stage. And from that, you had immediately indicted and convicted any number of people without having all the facts. So you start off with a, a media that has already made decisions, instead of a media that's looking to provide facts so that you can hopefully at some point in time get to a truth here. And then what has been equally perplexing is we've seen many of the same members of that media that were so quick to indict and convict have now migrated to the other end of the spectrum. And now what they have done is indicted and convicted the, the woman who is the accuser and anybody surrounding the prosecutor's office. Now again, as I said before, I have some very serious questions of everybody in this case. And I don't pretend to know what happened. But to me, it seems like you're doing a tremendous disservice to a consuming public by saying that you have the ability to determine what happened there. And you will stamp either guilty or not guilty on a variety of people without a, a factual basis for it. So that's the difficulty that I've seen with, with the media coverage of this. And that's how it ties in with some of the higher profile cases we're talking about. The, the bottom line message for you folks, before we open this all up, is, is as far as the media is concerned, what we have to realize is that, is that truth is not always an instant destination. And sometimes getting to the truth is a journey. <coughs> and the job of the media should be to help guide people along on that journey and hopefully, ultimately, get to a truth, not to create the truth for somebody. Oftentimes, we in the media do a marvelous job of that. Oftentimes, we do a very poor job of that. So the message, any of you ever get there, would be keep in mind that sometimes getting to the truth is a journey. So let's talk a little bit about some of what we've been talking about here. My hope is, again, that there's some questions and thoughts that you all might have. Yes? Yeah, uh, more time, that's off a professor here I teach ethics, and my interest lately has been uh, Mr. Nifong and the charges against him with the state bar. What is the media story? How is it different if he had not made as many statements as he made in March? Because there's certainly some suggestion that this case would have been big for a few days, but not what it became. So I'm interested, and you're a prosecutor, assess his sort of proximate good, causal role right. in this story? Good, good question. I think the, the short answer is I, I think the, the media attention would have been extraordinary regardless of what he said. But in terms of his position, you know, I, I've often said, again, having spent a number of years as a prosecutor, a prosecutor has a legitimate public relations function. The, part of what you have to do as a prosecutor is engender confidence in the integrity of the process. Now, where you run into problems is when people start thinking the job of a prosecutor is to get convictions. There's a distinction between the two, and I, I, I would think this audience certainly would understand that. My criticism was, in the very beginning, I thought the prosecutor talked too much and um, was too conclusory in his comments and too accusatory in his comments. In the end, I didn't think he talked enough, because what he did is he backed off so completely that people were losing confidence in the system. They didn't understand, well, what explain to us, please, why this is all happening. Um, explain to us why, when you were so certain in the beginning, why we're now dismissing these charges. And again, you know, and my thoughts, quick lesson, any of you are going to become prosecutors, if from the very beginning you say to the public, especially high profile cases, look, understand my role here. My role is to present this to a grand jury. If a grand jury says I'm moving forward, I will do that. My job is not to obtain a conviction my job is to move the case forward. And if I try this and a trial jury says not guilty, that doesn't mean I failed in my job. It means that the system worked. 
in this case. And I think the, the, the short answer is, had he been less accusatory in the beginning, um, it would have been a little bit of a different spin, but I, I don't think it would have changed dramatically. I, I think, again, this is one of these situations where you see the media jumps on something. We're seeing it right now with the, the, the woman astronaut. And all of a sudden, it's the head, the, uh, headlines on every newspaper. Every cable network is leading with it and doing 24 hours coverage of it. it it's the, the, the beast, the ravenous beast sort of jumps um, from, from one body to another, if you will. But I, I think that what he said in the beginning was inappropriate. It did fan the flames. But I think even without that, it, it, we probably would be in the same position that, that we are now in terms of the media interest and in all this. So, yes? Uh, my name is Michael Pusateram, a second year law student here. And uh, you spoke about you know, opinion is power, and you spoke about sort of the dangers and the impacts of judgment. And so my question is, when you at Court TV or in the media stick a camera in one of these courtrooms, uh, and I'll use the example of the, the gentleman who was potentially poisoned by his wife, there are issues of motive here, there are deep, complex, interpersonal relationships, I don't know, uh, whatever comes out during that trial to discuss motives, um, maybe there was adultery, maybe there was domestic violence, um, but in sticking that camera in the courtroom and sort of revealing these deep interpersonal relationships, um, you're almost inviting, if not begging, the public to make these judgments. And so now here's a guy who's dead, and maybe, you know, whatever bad things come out about him that might have established a motive, you know, maybe you sort of tarnished his legacy. Do you think that's fair to the people who are involved <coughs> in these trials? I, I think if you start off with the premise that trials are public, which they are, um, it seems to me that what is most fair to people involved in trials is to make it as public as possible. And here's why I say that. When I was, and I'll give you an illustration. When I was asked to defend this, the first of the death penalty cases in Northeast, we had an application to put cameras in our courtroom. Now, as a knee-jerk reaction, as a defense lawyer, I, first thing I said is, I don't think I want cameras in my courtroom. Obviously, this was before I was doing this business. But for some reason, I, I said, I don't want them. I sat down and, and met with my client and his mother. And his mother was, this was a case that had race elements to it. I was defending a young black man who had shot and killed a young white man, a drug deal went bad. It was the first of the death penalties. Nobody really knew what, what the criteria should be. Um, race was going to be a factor. And I remember saying to, to my client and his mother, and his mother was just this, this, this wonderful woman raising like five kids by herself. It reminded me of my mom. My, my father disappeared on us when I was five. My mom raised four kids all by herself. So I saw this woman and saw a lot of my mother and her, and I said, yeah, I'll do this. The fact that you don't have any money is fine. I don't need to get paid. I'm going to do it. So we're having this conversation and, about not having the cameras in the courtroom, and she stops me and she says, Jack, she said, why do you want a camera in the courtroom? And I really wasn't able to fully articulate a reason, and, and she said to me, this is my son's life. And it seems to me that the more people who get to watch what's going to happen in this courtroom, the better it is for us. The less chance that we have of, of there being some sort of racial problems that drives this verdict, the less chance we have of a judge not being fair. And I, I thought about it, and I, I came to agree with her. And I came to be, and this was again before I was doing this for a living. Um, I tried a couple of other death penalty cases that had cameras. I tried the first, one of the first corporate homicide cases in the country, we had cameras. And I just came to believe that when I would look back at the coverage of cases I tried beforehand that were high profile, and I'd look at the reporting at it, and I'd see you know, two columns on 10 witnesses that we had that day, and I see somebody try and write down, putting in, in quotes my words, and I'd say, I know I didn't say that and yet it gets in the newspaper in quotes. And I know they missed completely the point of this witness. The bottom line, I think, is this. It, will more people become attracted to, to the salacious aspects of it? Yeah, if you have a trial that has that kind of thing to it. But the greater good that I've witnessed, both as a participant and as an observer, is that what is happening in there is, is fairly characterized. It's fairly, actually fairly disclosed and shown rather than being characterized. And to me, there's no substitute for accuracy. The camera gives you accuracy. You don't have to rely upon somebody how fast they can write sitting inside a courtroom taking place. And it brings me a good question. How many of you folks, if, if you were a, a, a asked this question, um, camera in a courtroom, does it belong, here's the caveat, with a trial judge making a determination it's the right type of case, trial judge making a determination that 
the right witnesses, if there are problems with witnesses or testimony, having control of cameras in the courtroom. How many of you, generally speaking, are in favor of the notions of cameras in courtrooms? Okay, all right. A little higher number than actually I find. I, I, sometimes when I get out with the public, and again, a lot of this is a consequence of people saying to me they condemn the cameras because of, of, of the OJ trial. Now, that's another conversation we can have about cameras in the courtroom. Yes? I noticed in your comments on the uh, O.J. Simpson trial that you appeared to think that Judge Ito's behavior is not to be much criticized. No, no. I, I didn't mean to I'm communicate it in that I, fashion. I sat through the second federal Oklahoma City trial. Right. Uh, it was my view that Judge Mache's control of the courtroom contributed to the public sense of you know, that what was going on there was all right, as oh, contrasted right. with Judge Ito. Absolutely. You know, no, I, I, I'm not. Unless he let him do it. No, I don't disagree with you at all. And, I, and if, if it sounded that way, I didn't mean it to be that way. Judge Mach, as, as I said, for the first one that I covered, I would have loved to have a camera watch him. I mean, some people were describing him as the anti Ito. I think it's a little strong against Judge Ito. Um, no, D Judge Ito let things happen in his courtroom that he should not have let it happen in his courtroom. So I, I'm not trying to exonerate him in any fashion. Um, but, but. That Please. Because in the second Oklahoma City trial, we had some evidence maybe that courtroom cameras might not be good. There was a witness who had said, you know, I'm going to be famous because mm. I'm going to be a witness in a federal trial and I'm going to make a million dollars from that. Is the perception that you get famous by being on cameras something that affects witness behavior in a way that the jury system and cross examination, all the things were taught? can't quite get at. Yeah, it, it, it's a very good question. Let me, it, and you might be surprised at what we've found, and this is anecdotal, because I don't know that you can do anything other than anecdotally. We have had far more instances in our history of, at Court TV, now 16, 17 years, far more instances of witnesses opting out of going on camera than we had of instances of Cato Kalin-like instances, where, where somebody's looking, you know, in our society now that creates instant celebrities, you know, it used to be you were a celebrity because you did something. Now you were a celebrity because somebody said you're a celebrity. Well, you know, Cato Callen was, was the ultimate instance of that. But again, he's the, I think, the exception. We have more often, um, and, and we probably should do some sort of statistical analysis of this, but I'm always amazed how often people say, I don't want to be on camera. And even though, and I'm not talking about victims in cases where you'd expect that but just everyday people who are coming in to testify and they say, you know what, I don't need my Andy Warhol 15 minutes of fame. I'd rather not be on it. So I, I think the, the answer to your question is, is, does that need to be a concern? Absolutely. I've always said the antidote to any problem that anybody raises about cameras in the courtroom, and they tend to be historically witnesses acting up, lawyers acting up, uh, problems with evidence that people couldn't see. The antidote for all of those is a good trial judge. Because what we've seen is good trial judges manage their courtrooms. And part of that management process involves managing the camera. I'll tell you an interesting adjunct to the story I told about the, my client's mother wanting to be on our, our case to be in, in the courtroom. First of all, she was right. The trial judge, who was a, a dear personal friend of mine, I, I actually spoke at, at, sadly, both his retirement and at his funeral. But I would even say to him in lighter moments, he should have collected his paycheck from the prosecutor's office because he was just absolutely another prosecutor on the bench. And when I was a prosecutor, I was delighted when I tried cases for him there. When I was a defense attorney, I was less than delighted. We put a camera in the courtroom, and I had never seen him so down the middle as a judge before or after. So there is that sort of consequence that I've seen firsthand. Again, it's anecdotal, but I've seen it. Judges, more judge-like, lawyers better prepared. The mother of my client, when it came time, we knew we were going to be at the penalty phase. As you know, death penalties, two trials, the guilt phase, the penalty phase. He had confessed. We knew we were going to get to be a penalty phase. And I knew if anyone was going to save his life, it was going to be his mother. The night before she was going to testify, she called me at home. And she said, Jack, I'm worried. I, I don't think, I know what I said about the cameras, and I like it. I don't think I can say what I need to say to save his life if I know I'm on TV. So we went in the next morning, I grabbed the prosecutor, we went back in the judge's chambers, and I said, Judge, I need you to turn the camera off when she testifies. And we had our argument, and the media attorneys were there, and the judge good, said, this is too important for me to run any risk here. So I'll give you an audio feed, but I'm going to turn the cameras off when his mother comes to testify. And she did, and he did not receive the death penalty. But it was an illustration, again, of how you can manage these things. You know, you don't need absolutes. 
You can manage a camera in the courtroom, and it provides people with an understanding of what's going on, and, and a real value, I think. Anyway, based on that question. Yes? What do you think about cameras in the Supreme Court? That's good. That's a great question. And I actually had a chance. I was, I was speaking before a gathering of the federal judiciary once, and I had three of the justices in the front row. And as I said to them, um, uh, I said, this is nice for me that I have the, the mic, and, and I, I, nobody can say, thank you, Mr. Ford. We've heard enough from you. But what I said to them is this. Again, if you look at all of the arguments against cameras and courtrooms, and I said to them, I said, why can't my children, who were in high school and grammar school at the time, why can't they see the great issues of our time being argued? Why can't they see abortion rights and flag burning and, and Bush versus Gore? Why can't they see that all being argued? And I said to the justices, OK, let's look at the arguments, that the lawyers will act up, witnesses will act up. I said, there are no witnesses in your courtroom. How about that the lawyers will act up? I said, well, you know what? I've been in your courtroom, and I don't think there's a real danger of somebody getting a, a top hat and a cane and dancing on a table to get their Andy Warhol 15 minutes in your courtroom. So I am at a loss for what it is, other than I, I, I've got two thoughts. One is, I think the justices enjoy their anonymity. They can walk down the streets of, somebody did a, I said this facetiously once, it's probably not facetious, more people will tell you who the last two winners of American Idol are than can tell you names of justices in the US Supreme Court. They can walk down the streets of Washington and not be bothered by people, and I don't think they want to give up that anonymity. And the other thing is, I think it's a generational thing. I think I look at my, at, at my daughter and son's generations, your generations, you are a, you're a video age. And I think the notion of seeing something is part of, of, of the fabric of your existence here. I think there'll be a shift with sort of, John Roberts has said, I'll look at it. I don't know how soon it's gonna happen, but he, I think it's, 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 it's worth, I can't come up with an argument against it. And I've tried, just to argue both sides, I can't come up with an argument against it. Do we have time or are we? We have, do we have one more? We've, we've run out of pizza, so I think it's time to, we have one more in the back. To elaborate a little more on your point uh, of cameras, uh, well, if, if you were to let people watch uh, arguments in important issues like abortion and Bush versus war, don't you think that uh, judges may actually receive death threats? Uh, well, I, I, it, it, that's an important concern, I'm sure. And I, I'm sure it's a concern now of judges, although let's not by, be naive, uh, that takes place currently, even when there are no cameras in the courtroom. I mean, we'll, here's, here's the first point that I make oftentimes. How many people do you really think are going to watch the Supreme Court arguments? <laughs> I mean, some of us will because we, we have a, an interest in it, um, a professional interest, just a, a deep-seated curiosity. You know what? You're not going to have any real ratings grabbers going on there. And the reality is these great issues, when you think about it sometimes, the arguments themselves are not terribly scintillating, again, unless you, unless you have a passion for the law. So, so let's be real. It's, it's like C-SPAN. How many people watch C-SPAN? I mean, the numbers are minuscule, but it serves a very important function. Just because the numbers are low doesn't mean that it shouldn't exist. And that's the argument I make for, for cameras in the Supreme Court. You know, will, it, will it change the dynamic? No, I don't think it will. And again, I've been there and I've covered them and I've argued them. I don't think it's going to change the dynamic at all. It'll change uh, the, that recognition factor. Might it heighten, to some extent, security issues because more people will watch it? I, I don't know. Um, I'm a little reluctant to say that that would have a, a big impact on that, but it, it's it's I, I can't discount it as a as a concern certainly. But you know how much how often do you talk in your classes about risk benefit analysis? That's I think what you engage in here, and and my perception is risk benefit analysis the benefit far outweighs um, any of the risks that we could talk about. So I think that does it. My my thanks to all of you for spending some time here. Just by way of announcements of future events, the uh, program on public law has a couple of more you know, lunchtime events planned for different aspects of the public cross trial during the semester. So stay tuned to Duke Law Daily for those announcements when they come out. Thanks again for coming. That was fun. Great. Thanks.